This is a day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Church Street United Methodist Church proudly presents Rejoice. Good morning and welcome to Rejoice, the weekly devotional program brought to you by Church Street United Methodist Church in Knoxville, Tennessee. My name is Andy Ferguson and I'm pleased to be one of the pastors at Church Street. I dug out my Christmas storybooks right after Thanksgiving. Put away since last Christmas, I figured it was time to get out my stories. Sitting with them is like spending time with old friends. Somewhere in the pile, I found my worn copy of the best Christmas pageant ever by Barbara Robinson. I turned to the last chapter. Like me, you already know the buildup and you've already met the infamous Herdman children. I wanted to read the climax of the story. I'll share it with you now. Ralph and Imogene were there all right, only for once they didn't come through the door pushing each other out of the way. They just stood there for a minute as if they weren't sure they were in the right place because of the candles, I guess, and the church being full of people. They look like people you see on the six o'clock news, refugees sent to wait in some strange, ugly place with all their boxes and sacks around them. It suddenly occurred to me that this was just the way it must have been for the real Holy Family, stuck away in a barn by people who didn't much care what happened to them. They couldn't have been very neat and tidy either, but more like this, Mary and Joseph, Imogene's veil was cockeyed as usual, and Ralph's hair stuck out all around his ears. Imogene had the baby doll, but wasn't carrying it the way she's supposed to, cradled in her arms. She had it slung up over her shoulder, and before she put it in the manger, she thumped it twice on the back. I heard Alice gasp, and she poked me. I don't think it's very nice to burp the baby Jesus, she whispered, as if he had colic. And then she poked me again. Do you suppose he could have had colic? I said, I don't know why not, and I didn't. He could have had colic or been fussy or hungry like any other baby. After all, that was the whole point of Jesus, that he didn't come down on a cloud like something out of amazing comics, but that he was born and lived a real person. Right away, we had to sing while shepherds watched their flock by night, and we had to sing very loud because there were more shepherds than anything else and they made so much noise, banging their crooks around like a lot of, lot of hockey sticks. Next came Gladys from behind the angel choir, pushing people out of the way and stepping on everyone's feet. Since Gladys was the only one in the pageant who had anything to say, she made the most of it. Hey, unto you a child is born, she hollered as if it was for sure the best news in the world. And all the shepherds trembled, sore afraid of Gladys mainly, but it looked good anyway. And then came three carols about angels. It took that long to get the angels in because they were primary kids and got nervous and cried and forgot where they were supposed to go and bent their wings in the door and things like that. I was so busy planning new ways to save the baby Jesus that I missed the beginning of Silent Night. But it was all right because everyone sang Silent Night, including the audience. We sang all the verses too. And when we got to Son of God, Love's Pure Light, I happened to look at Imogene and I almost dropped my hymn book on a baby angel. Everyone had been waiting all the time for the herdmans to do something absolutely unexpected and sure enough, that is what happened. Imogene Herdman was crying. In the candlelight, her face was all shiny with tears and she didn't even bother to wipe them away. She just sat there, awful old Imogene, in her crookedy veil, crying and crying and crying. Well, it was the best Christmas pageant we ever had. It occurs to me that when we celebrate Christmas, we take an idea and give it a kind of flesh. Gladys in the story said the basic idea clearly, hey, unto you a child is born with such a simple idea and the conviction that this child is God's gift, you and I set out to make Christmas. I thank God that we refuse to leave Christmas in the pages of the Bible but take a whole season to give Christmas size and shape, that we find a hundred ways to make it real. Just think how much poorer our Christmas would be if we banned all the ways we celebrate. Some of our Christmas, Christmas traditions are grand, some are sweet, 
Some miss the point. Still, they are our efforts to give Christmas a, a living place in our lives. All this is instructive as we think about our, what we commonly read, but, but, but mostly underappreciate in the Christmas passages from the Bible. The prologue of John speaks of the Word of God taking flesh and dwelling among us. It is a grand idea, but just an idea. The birth stories from Matthew and Luke give John's grand idea, flesh and blood, just as our Christmas celebrations give that grand idea, size and shape and life. We're going to read from John chapter 1 this morning. I hope you'll get your Bible so you can read along with me. As you're finding the place, let's listen as our parish women's choir sings Toda Pulcra Es, Completely Beautiful He Is. Now, if you would, take your Bible. We're going to turn to John chapter 1, verse 1, and read. I'm reading from the New Jerusalem Bible. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things came into being. Not one thing came into being except through Him. What has come into being in Him was life. Life was the, that was the light of men, and light shines in darkness and darkness could not overpower it. A man came sent by God. His name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness to the light so that everyone might believe through him. He was not the light, he was to bear witness to the light. The word was the real light that gives light to everyone. He was coming into the world. He was in the world that had come into being through him and the world did not recognize him. He came to his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to those who did accept him, he gave power to become children of God. To those who believed in his name, who were born not from human stock or human desire or human will, but from God himself. The word became flesh, he lived among us, and we saw his glory. The glory that he has from the Father as only son of the Father, full of grace and truth. John witnesses to him and he proclaims, this is the one of whom I said, he who comes after me has passed ahead of me because he existed before me. Indeed, from his fullness we have all of us received one gift replacing another. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth have come through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. 
It is the only Son who is close to the Father's heart who has made him known. God's word for God's people. Would you pray? God, we receive this word. Let it be for us living water. Let it be for us word taking flesh in our hearts. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. According to the prologue of John, a man came sent by God. His name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness to the light so that everyone might believe through him. He was not the light. He was to bear witness to the light. Now, John, the great witness, stood at the collision of the ages. He was the final face of the old. Jesus, whom John announced, is the new face of the new age. The first face of Advent is the fearsome face of John. He is the final Old Testament prophet, stern and unflinching in the face of change. There's a sketch somewhere of the the laughing Jesus. I saw it hanging on the wall of a pastor friend years ago. Since then, I've been looking for my own copy, but without success. It pictures Jesus as loving, approachable, and joyous at the work. You would never see a similar picture of the laughing John the Baptist. John the forerunner was stern and condemning. John stood up against the powerful of his day and lost his life for his unflinching candor. John was the messianic herald who stands on the frontier as the ages collide, destined to bear the impact. John throws his accusation against the religious leaders of his own time. Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? We read that last Sunday, confident that he was addressing the religious leaders alone and equally confident that he would have welcomed people like us with open arms. If John could have baptized the Pharisees and Sadducees in a bat of boiling water, he would have gladly done it. In the same way, we're confident that John would have chosen a calm stretch of the River Jordan, free of turbulence and debris for our baptisms. We are confident, you see, that John's face would have softened on sighting us heading down to wash in the river in preparation for meeting the Heavenly Father. Still, John the Baptist represents the Old Testament, the old way, the old thinking, and the God we saw in the Old Testament. That old thinking is still with us. Around the world, religion continues to be a source of division and criticism among peoples. This is the legacy of the old. The Washington Post this week showed a gallery of pictures portraying the armed and violent conflict between Muslims and Christians in the Central African Republic. This nation sits immediately west of South Sudan, where United Methodists have missionaries and churches. Is it politics or ancient tribal conflicts that divide them? Is it truly religion that separates the people of that nation? Sadly, the the news portrays the conflict as one between Christians and Muslim It is that old legacy at work. People have been talking about the new category of believers identified in the United States recently. They call themselves the nuns, N-O-N-E-S. When a computer form asks for religious affiliation, their answer is none. Thus, they call themselves the nuns. Only in America can a decision not to believe become an identified religion. When Americans look at the Arab world, We are often reminded that our Christian religion is not welcome there. To make matters worse, it is often illegal to make efforts to convert a Muslim person in those nations to the Christian faith. The old way which John represented divided the world into those like us from those different from us, from those with us, from those against us. And even within the land of of Israel, the old way drew a dividing line between those who were good enough and those who did not measure up. As the people of John's day got the idea he was proclaiming, they went out to him in the wilderness to be baptized with the waters of repentance in the Jordan. Hearing his idea, they made it concrete in their lives by that act of humility and return. Now the passage we read for Christmas this morning is one that connects the old and the new It identifies the role and the place of John in the great plan of God. John is the forerunner. He prepares the way. He is the voice of the one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. At the same time, the prologue points toward the word of God taking flesh in Jesus Christ, 
so forcefully that the word overshadows John's role in history. Such is the fate of those who faithfully announce the one who comes after them. As they are clear and successful at their work, the one who follows takes center stage, leaving the faithful witness in the shadow. How else could it be? The scripture says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things came into being. Not one thing came into being except through him. What has come into being in him was life. Life was the, the light of men and the light shines in darkness and darkness could not overpower it. What more could John possibly say? In the days before Jesus' ministry began, there was no other one to make the announcement. There was no other way to explain what God was about to do. God has no interest in dropping down out of heaven like some space visitor. In Jesus, God is not popping up out of nowhere. God is taking flesh in the fullness of time, the great history of Israel, the prophets, and even the star the Magi followed all point to the fullness of time when the Christ should be born. So with all this preparation, the Christ is born. Think about it. What a wonderful metaphor God chose for entering our common life. When God chose to be born of Mary, the woman conceives, the child grows in her womb, in the fullness of her pregnancy, in the fullness of her time, she delivers her child, a living being, Again, God's idea now taking flesh in the child born to Mary. And then in the birth of Jesus, this new initiative of the Heavenly Father moves from idea to a living being walking among us on this earth. As the prologue says, the Word became flesh and He lived among us and we saw His glory, the glory that He has from the Father as, only the, as the only Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. How do such, such words, such ideas become real in human history? They might have remained the lofty thoughts of seers and sages. They might have remained the hopes of the prophets. But God's great work at Christmas, those words took human form and walked among us. Years ago, my mother was killed in a tragic car wreck. Friend Dennis went with me to see the wrecked car and to retrieve, retrieve her belongings. We found the junkyard where the car had been taken, went to the office to get directions. Finally, we found it. I was struck as I stood there looking at the wreck that the collision must have been a terrible blow for my mother. Dennis, realizing how the sight of the wrecked car affected me, said, this is getting too incarnational. You wait, I'll look for the personal things. And with that, he knelt down beside the car and began to explore the glass-littered carpet for anything that might have dropped. And when he found something, he turned to offer it to me, and I saw that his hands were bloody from reaching through the broken glass. And I thought to myself that I was supposed to be the one who bled. So this is what taking flesh means. The incredible joy of Christmas is that God has taken human flesh to dwell with us. God is no longer far away in heavenly splendor. God is with us. God no longer stands at regal distance from the affairs and the troubles of human existence. God walks beside us. The other night, rather late, I was walking through the UT hospital to the MRI lab. I've been there before, so I didn't have to stop for directions. As I walked through the main lobby of the hospital, I saw a fellow who appeared to be lost, he was on the house phone asking directions, but it was, it was not working. As he hung up the phone, he seemed to be about as lost as he was before he called. I realized that he had others in his party who were fanning out looking for the destination. So I asked him if I could help him find some place, and he said, yes, I'm looking for the MRI lab. Do you know the way? And I said, not only do I know the way, I'm going there right now, we can walk together. And soon the fellow was beside me with his group of family following along. Because I had been thinking about this passage and its message, it occurred to me that our walking through the hospital was a bit like Jesus walking on earth, showing us the way. I was able to take the, the scribbled directions on his piece of paper and live them out beside him. 
Well, I'm, I'm not going to claim any more of Jesus than that. Yet every time we share the journey with another who does not know the way, we give something real and concrete to the ideas that we're following. John said, he who comes after me has passed ahead of me because he existed before me. How do we give the unreachable God flesh and blood among us? On Christmas, this unreachable God humbled himself and taking human flesh like ours, he was born of Mary. The almighty creator of all worlds came among us in vulnerability and incredible grace. As a result, the Christmas season is the sum of our many efforts to give God's incredible love size and weight and time in our world. And suddenly I understand the awe of the shepherds on the night the angels announced his birth. Sit right now with the incredible gift of Christmas this morning. Wrap your mind around all that God has done in the birth of Jesus Christ and then go out to make it real somehow so that others may get it too. Well, as you're doing that, let us listen as our parish adult choir with soloist Jamie Anderson sings the beautiful carol, Luli Lule.
Today, the Parish Adult Choir of Church Street is presenting a service of lessons and carols at 11 a.m. I invite you to join us for this beautiful gift of music and scripture. It is in the nave, the choir will sing, and there is brass, which begins actually a little bit earlier than 11, so I invite you to come. As you also plan to observe Christmas Eve, I want to invite you to worship with us at Church Street United Methodist Church. I want to tell you about three of our Christmas Eve services. 12 noon is a service of carols and communion. We call it the first service of Christmas. It has been, it was designed to, to help people who simply didn't want to be out at night. What we discovered that it is a great help to families who have busy evenings or travel plans. Either way, we invite you to come and worship with us. 5 p.m. is the early great service of Christmas with brass and choir and candlelight is, and communion. It is, it is a, a wonderful service and the parish choir sings, adult choir sings at that service. Again at 1030 in the evening on Christmas Eve is the later great service of Christmas. Again, brass and choir and candlelight and communion. All of those are, um, are, are, are part of those Christmas services. You can find more about this by calling the church office or looking on the website, but we invite you to, be a, to join us for these worship services. They are a way that we can celebrate a holy Advent. I hope you're enjoying the Advent devotional book that you received this Advent season. We have been pleased to share it with you, and I hope you've enjoyed both the, the pictures the children gave us as well as the, the thoughts that were shared by members of the congregation. I also want to invite you to worship this and every Sunday at Church Street United Methodist Church at 8.30 and 11 a.m. in the nave. And want to invite you to midweek communion. Uh, that is on Wednesday at noon. This particular week, we're going to be celebrating a service of Blue Christmas, recognizing that not everyone is delighted and happy at Christmas time. Some of us have reasons to be sad, mainly because we're missing someone, someone who has been lost from our family circle, I invite you to come as we, we share this time again in, in the presence of God. It is, it is a holy time. Well, in closing, I'm Andy Ferguson, pastor at Church Street United Methodist Church in Knoxville, Tennessee. I thank you for letting me share this devotional time with you in your home. And now as I go, my wish for you is that you might live each day like out of the corner of your eye, you've just caught sight of God and realize that God is headed your way. and friends of Church Street United Methodist Church, your downtown church at the corner of Henley and Main, would like to thank you for joining Rejoice. Please send us your comments and suggestions, and be sure to tune in next Sunday at this same time for Rejoice.